Welcome in Rich Life family. So we got another great tactical training tonight. This is uh, one of my brothers as well as an amazing business role model that I know a lot of people look up to uh, for many various reasons. Uh, but we got tonight uh, my buddy Josh Cunningham who is the CEO and founder of Rockerbox uh, which is an inside sales assistant company based in College Station, Texas. And after starting Rockerbox only six years ago, he's covered so much ground. Josh's real estate company has worked over 2 million internet leads for teams all across the country, including Lars Hedenberg, Jeff Cohn, some of the biggest names in real estate. And having hired and trained over 250 ISAs, uh, Josh is a sought after speaker for his invaluable knowledge on developing company culture, a big piece that a lot of people struggle with, right? To attract that amazing talent into your organization, to cultivate those individuals and optimize those individuals to collectively achieve a goal. And he is somebody that I have seen do this at a world-class level. Um, to get millennials to buy into a vision, right, and stay there is already a challenge in itself, but to actually get the results that he's gotten, not only in his own company, but for other clients and companies all across the industry has been nothing short of amazing and impressive. So, Josh, welcome, my brother. How you doing, man? Hey, thanks, Matt, for having me. It's, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here at the, the Rich Life Academy, pouring some knowledge, man. Awesome, man. Well, uh, for those that are watching this live, uh, I know we got the chat live, so feel free to say what up to Josh. Let him know where uh, you are tuning in from. Um, we'll be, he's actually got a presentation for us here tonight. Um, so know that uh, you can ask some questions, you can pepper in some questions, and we'll make sure to, uh, you know, throw those in in the, in the right time. But I want to make sure that um, you guys have the opportunity to really pick his brain because of not only the ability to acquire talent and we know that, you know, through people is how we become scalable and get big results, but at the same time to really use talent acquisition to grow your company and to create a vision and a brand behind that, uh, something that he's done really well. And I, you guys got to have access to him tonight. So, um, if you're watching this live or if you're watching this recording, be sure to, uh, take a picture, post it on social media, uh, share, uh, what we have going on in the community with anybody else that uh, may be interested, be sure to tag um, the Rich Life Academy. And uh, with that being said, I want to start, Josh, by just uh, give us a, an idea of, you know, where did the idea for Rockerbox come? I know you and I have talked a little bit about this in the past, but I don't really know of where this inception kind of came into play in, in your own entrepreneurial journey. Sure. Yeah. You know, in, uh, in the spirit of a uh, great mastermind form, obviously I've, I've learned quite a bit from you, Matt, in my, uh, in my young professional career. And so obviously very excited to be here today and, and, and to exchange some of that information back with you. But, uh, but my young professional career really got like a steroid shot back in 2011. Um, I always say that the definition of luck is when preparedness meets opportunity. I'm sure you've heard of that before. Um, but, oh, yeah. uh, my my uh, career kind of got a jump start when I went to a conference in Vegas, of all places, when you're talking about luck. And uh, I ran into Frank Klesitz, the founder and CEO of Viral Marketing. You know Frank, don't you, Matt? Oh, yeah. And um, we were at a, actually a Mike Ferry conference. At the time, I was just a recruiter for a local real estate firm. And uh, Frank and I met at this real estate conference and just kind of hit it off talking about business and entrepreneurship and sales and marketing and um, just really connected, you know, we can tell we we're cut from the same cloth and, and really inspired and motivated by the same things. And, um, and so shortly after the conference, I really had no idea who he was. I just thought he might've been a, a, you know, a vendor or a realtor there, but didn't really pay that much attention. And of course we connected on Facebook at the time. Facebook was still, uh, it wasn't as popular and as, you know, much of a necessity as it is today, but we connected on Facebook and, uh, started following him and noticing that he had a ton of great content out there, you know, um, putting out uh, content, positioning him how, himself as a trusted authority in, in all sorts of marketing topics. But specifically, he was helping real estate agents stay in touch with their database by putting out educational content on YouTube and social media platforms. And so I literally, like I always said, the definition of luck is when preparedness meets opportunity. I reached out to Frank on Facebook and I said, you know, I, I knew that he, uh, again, we'd hung out at this real estate conference, but when I did further um, investigation on his company, he actually had a list of all of his clients on his website. And I could see, I recognized a lot of these names because these names were the people that were on stage presenting at this conference. And I thought to myself, well, this guy 
has all the top agents as clients, right? He must be doing something right. And if he gets to like work with these people on a month to month basis, that means a lot of exposure and a lot of interaction with a lot of these top minds. And so I thought, well, Hey man, this is an opportunity. I got to take action. And so I literally posted on his Facebook wall. I've got a, a picture of it later on in the presentation, but I posted on his Facebook wall and I said, Hey, how can I work for viral marketing from college station? Cause I, I didn't want to move to Omaha, Nebraska. So that was kind of where I got my, um, you know, foot in the door, so to speak. Um, you know, kind of had that that one, you know, specific pivotal moment in my young professional career to make that decision to take action, to move forward, and uh, to get myself around, you know, those top minds and those top groups of people. Um, and so I joined Viral Marketing, and then while I was at Viral Marketing, I got to travel the country with Frank. We went to, you know, tons of masterminds, tons of real estate events. That's where we crossed paths probably at some point in time. Yep. And, uh, you know, got to rub elbows with all the top minds in the real estate industry and, you know, get to go have drinks and dinner with them and learn about what, what drives them, what motivates them, you know, what, uh, what makes them tick, what some of their secrets to success were. Um, but along the way, the, the most common denominator that I kept hearing over and over and over was, uh, you know, back in 2011, 2012, internet leads were really kind of a new thing. Um, there, was, there was less searches than there were actually homes sold. So there was somewhat of a sense of exclusivity. It was still a new penetrating market and a lot of people really didn't know what to do. Um, so a lot of these top agents, and top teams were just overwhelmed with the number uh, of registrations that they had taking on. And so that was where the seed was kind of planted. You know, again, it was from a mastermind actually that Frank and I were attending and uh, it was a really high level mastermind. You know, 50 of the top agents in the country go around the room, share what works well and what, what's their pain points. And almost 80% of the room said something about, hey, my internet leads, I don't really know this game yet. I don't know how to follow up with them. I don't know how to hold my agents accountable. I don't know what, what processes and systems I should put in place. And uh, like any good entrepreneur, you know, Frank and I turned to each other and said, well, hey, if this viral marketing thing doesn't work out, I guess we could always start a, you know, a call center. And so it actually was about a year and a half later that I, I again, um, saw another opportunity and, and rose to that challenge to... Uh, to take on um, the whole, whole inception of rock the box and I'll, I'll dive into a lot more of that later. But, um, but yeah, that's kind of how it was, man. Like I said, definition of luck is when preparedness meets opportunity. You got to put yourself in those, those opportunistic places and, uh, and be ready to take action, move forward and, and, uh, and change your life. Dude. One, one thing that I've always admired about you as is your ability to take not only consistent action, but massive action and you're quick. Mm -hmm. um, and to see the amount of ground that you've covered, with your company being, you know, let's just say a small seed company, an idea to now where it's at today with the actual, you know, results and accolades and, uh, and really company that you've built. It's, it's amazing, man. So I just want to congratulate you on, on all your success because it's been fun to watch. Um, and it's been also uh, fun to dissect because I know you have so much wisdom and, and probably a lot of failures and also so many great peaks and, and successes that you've hit along the way. And so one thing that I've, I've seen you excel really at is creating this vision and this company culture. And not only because I know a lot of people have a vision, right? And, but you've been so good at getting people to buy into your vision and to mm -hmm. create a culture around that vision. And that has been really impressive to me. So I, I know you're going to probably talk a little bit about that today and just how you've been able to identify quality candidates and get them into your organization, to onboard them properly, to make sure they're a culture fit, you know, and then to get that collaboration and that kind of exponential growth. Uh, so many things that I want to ask you about, but I'm sure you're going to be talking a little bit about that today. Um, so with that being said, uh, I, I'm happy to hand over the screen share to you and sure. uh, let you do your thing. And then if you guys have questions, be sure to pepper those in uh, the chat and we're going to wrap up, you know, maybe 15, 20 minutes before and, and open it up for some Q and a to take full advantage of how, as you're building your business, whether you're in real estate or not, right. Um, whether it's internet leads or whether it's, you know, retention of employees, attracting the right people into your organization, whether it's working leads and follow up, this guy has a massive amount of ground that he's covered in that particular space of business in general that can be applied to any sales organization. Uh, so with that being said, uh, you know, take full advantage of being able to pick his brain a little bit here today. I'll hand it over to you, my man. Sweet, Matt. I appreciate it. Uh, let me see if I can manage to share my screen now. Uh, 
All right, are we rocking and rolling? We're rocking, dude. All right. Um, so yeah, let's get started here. Um, like I said, you know, th this is a presentation I've been asked to give you know many times. So I'm super excited to be here in the in the private community and and to be sharing this with y'all and, and just go to a couple steps deeper than I really can go, uh, you know, when I come find on stage. So again, like Matt said, if you've got questions, um, fire them out and we'll, we'll get to those. But, uh, you know, like I said, the, the, the general topic here to guys, today, guys, is building a culture that drives success. And a couple of things that I promise that you're going to learn is, first of all, I'm going to actually give you the behind the scenes look at the whole conception development and, and growth of Rockerbox. The good, the bad, and the ugly. So I always say smart people learn from their mistakes, but smarter people learn from others' mistakes. So uh, I lend you that, that opportunity tonight. So um, the next thing we're gonna talk about is the millennial workforce invasion. So I have a very unique exposure to a new and emerging um, sort of segment in our, in our workforce. And so today, uh, today we're gonna actually talk about how to attract, hire, train, and retain that next um, uh, workforce that we're gonna be challenged with, which is the millennial workforce. Um, and then lastly here, I'm going to give you guys some very simple and effective tools uh, that you can actually implement to your business, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're an infopreneur, a solopreneur, whether you have a small team, a growing team, some simple and effective ways that you can start building culture within your organization because culture exists <laughs> whether you have an impact on it or not. And so these are some ways to actually have a positive impact on it. So um, like Matt said, uh, you know, my start kind of got started, uh, back with a lucky trip to Las Vegas. That right there is Frank Klesitz, the guy I was telling you all about the founder and CEO of viral marketing. And so, like I said, I met Frank at a, at a, at a random real estate conference and there's the actual post legitimately. Um, that's almost what that's almost seven years ago, right? Almost today. How can I work for viral marketing from college station? Right? So that's what it, it only takes one thing, one chance, one question, one opportunity, one connection to really change your life. And so uh, I reached out to Frank and had one of the most unique um, and expensive uh, educations in the real estate space over the next several years. We got to go to all the different conferences, all the different masterminds, you know, buy our ways into the most prestigious rooms so we could be around the right people, so we could you know, learn what made the most successful people tick. Uh, and like I said, um, you know, when you learn what makes them successful, you're also going to get to hear what frustrates them. And uh, this is the very mastermind that I was at in 2011. It was a Boomtown mastermind. So for those of you who are in the real estate space, uh, Boomtown is a top CRM out there. And uh, this is the mastermind that Frank and I were sitting in. Uh, you can tell it's a little dated with uh, the pixel, one pixel quality camera there, I guess, that we were taking it from. But uh, essentially, this is the mastermind where I heard a bunch of people say, hey, here's this common problem that we have. And so the seed was planted in my mind at that point in time that if I could come up with a solution to this problem, which is a very good point there. A lot of times people are thinking of a new idea for a business, but you have to ask yourself, what problem does your business solve? Well, when you go around and you hear about a bunch of people complaining about a consistent problem, that's a really good business opportunity if you can figure out how to solve it. So fast forward to May, 2013, this is me with one of my best friends, Spring Benson out of Salt Lake City, Utah. And she was a client of mine through viral marketing. And she had a lot of the same frustrations that real estate teams did at that time um, that still do today. But uh, for her at that time, she was essentially investing in a lot of internet leads and a lot of lead flow and giving them away to her agents. And her agents weren't doing the greatest job of follow-up. They didn't necessarily know what they should be doing, how they should be doing, what they should be saying. And in the world of online lead generation, it could be very discouraging because um, you're literally looking for a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a percentage of people to get that closed deal. And so that's kind of where our name Rockerbox comes from. But anyway, back in uh, May, 2013, I started working with Spring, started working with her team. We started implementing some of these you know, hypothetical models and philosophies that we had learned from all these other successful teams. And what started as a one-time project wound up turning into a full-time business. And here's the reason why. The, the first person we hired to do this work um, very quickly graduated to go on and become their, uh, get, get a real estate license and become a real estate agent. So the problem that we had was we needed a consistent talent pool for being able to do this kind of work. And so that's when I got the idea that this isn't just a one-time job. I can't just coach your ISA and train them virtually, but we actually need to open up a business and we need to locate it right across the street from a, from a great talent pool. And I'm a former student of Texas A&M, graduate of Texas A&M. And despite all the Aggie jokes, it's actually a very prestigious university. So we get, uh, you know, typically the top 10% of the graduating high school class with students that are involved in all sorts of extracurricular activities. And they're coming to this town to invest in themselves 
and further their knowledge and, and further their experiences and, and advance their skills so that they can move on and get a great career somewhere. So I figure if I can go to this town and I have 55,000 students right there across the street, then I have a really good consistent talent pool to get to do this work. So that was the idea. That was the vision back in 2013. And um, I'm, I'm very glad to say, obviously, this is where our name came from. That's a rocker box. Go back to where the name is. That rocker box is an old gold mining tool, right? Look at that nitty gritty, dirty, grinding kind of work. You sit there with a, a pile of sand and gravel and you work it through this device all day long, very rigorously. And at the end of the day, you come out with a couple flakes of gold. And so that's where the analogy came from. That's where our name comes from. And so, you know, Rockerbox today, we're the premium uh, real estate inside sales agent solution uh, to identify buyers and sellers from internet leads. Um, so that was the vision. Like I said, I had it back in 2013. And so just to kind of give you the, the ta-da or the, the, the wow factor, here we are six years later and Spring, our first client ever, is still with us and she's managed to triple her business. Um, and she now, this year, year to date, is generating a 421% ROI from all of her internet lead spend, from uh, the CRM, from the ad spend, from Rockerbox. But this is actually an interview that we did with her because I'm really not going to blabble on today much about internet lead conversion. But if you want to learn more about internet lead conversion, go check out this interview. It's on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash Rockerbox. So if you go on there, give us a like. We have tons of client interviews. So if, you, if you're interested in learning more about internet lead conversion, that's where you want to go to find out that information. Today, what I wanted to come and tell you about, again, is the good, the bad, and the ugly behind building what we've built, which is now a multi-million dollar business. We service over 100 of the top producing agents from coast to coast. Like Matt said in my intro, we worked over 2 million internet leads, and we've uh, hired and trained over 250 ISAs. So we are the premium ISA solution. So again, today we're not talking about the internet leads. We're talking about the lessons learned from having built that business. So um, the first thing here I'd alluded to earlier is the actual workforce that we're talking about here. And here's some interesting facts that I think you guys are going to want to jot down. The first one is the professional workforce back in 2016. About 35% of it was made up of millennials. Well, if you look and fast forward the clock only five years from now, five, six years down the road, there's going to be a significant swing in that. It's going to, it's going to swing all the way up to 75%. So the workforce as we know it is going to shift very significantly over the next couple of years and it's going to be dominated by millennials, to which I have a great deal of experience working around over the last six years. So what we're going to talk about and some of these lessons learned and some of these culture tools not only, not only do they apply to everybody, but they're also very specific and, and, and relevant to this next upcoming workforce, which is the millennial workforce. So be advised. All right, so here's some of the things we're going to look for for a millennial ideal situation compared to you know, some of the other general, generalities of previous generations. Um, what a millennial is going to look for is meaningful work. You know, uh, Just a paycheck and a promise that you can clock in and clock out and get a paycheck is, is not going to be enough. Um, actually finding something about the work and what impact that it makes on a society or on a person is going to be uh, a much more of a driver than, than in previous generations. Um, they're also looking for a creative outlet. So they're going to be looking for, again, finding out things that they're good at, finding things that they're not good at, being creative, uh, learning and understanding from others that, um, that there's not always this straight line that everybody has to march down, which again is typical to um, previous generation type of work mentality. The other thing we're going to look at here is they love team oriented um, projects a team oriented environment. Again, previous generations were much more individually driven. Um, whereas this next millennial uh, workforce is going to be much more team oriented. And then lastly here, we're going to see some examples of them seeking out close and immediate feedback. Um, so communication is key, clarity is key, but the, the closer and the more immediate the feedback, the better. So, I'm going to rewind the clock here and go back to the story I was telling earlier back in 2013. So there I had the idea with spring, you know, we were training her ISA, we were having her do all the calls and she very quickly went off and became a real estate agent. So in July of 2013, I said, Hey spring, this isn't going to be, you know, a part-time project. This is going to be a full-time business like we discussed earlier. So in July of 2013, this is Rockerbox, as you know, at the world headquarters. That's it right there. A me, myself, and I operation. <laughs> Strapped up with a headset and got a couple, uh, couple monitors open up there as I'm monitoring a couple different beta clients and just pretty much saying yes to any kind of beta project I can get my hands on. If somebody had leads and they wanted them called, I'd call them. 
You know, invest in yourself. One of the easiest ways to learn is to offer to do work for free. Um, you know, you'd be amazed at uh, how much you can become a specialized in a subject um, and avoiding any type of certification or degrees by just actually going out and doing the work for free. You can get an incredible education doing that. So that's exactly what I did. This is me in July 2013, basically investing in myself, uh, doing beta testing for clients and, and figuring out what exactly is going to work and what's not going to work. And so it took me roughly about uh, a year and a half to two years of beta testing it on my own. By the way, that first picture here, this is actually in one of my friend's real estate offices. So this is actually looks like a very nice real estate office, but this is the, this is the glorious office, right? Everybody always remembers your first office, right? Not so glorious, right? A little 10 foot by 10 foot room and some little uh, office suite upstairs down a hall next to a leaky toilet, you know? Um, and you know, of course I built those, those desks by myself because uh, I couldn't afford to buy one of those nice stand up height desks that cost several hundred dollars online. At that time I'm, I'm bootstrapping the business. So I'm actually going down to the lumber yard and picking up some two by fours and particle board and applying my carpentry skills, which are, are not very non-existent. So that's the, that's the first, uh, the first office that we actually had, um, so to speak, not actually making calls out of my friend's real estate office anymore. Now I'm actually making calls out of our own real estate office. And so this is the world headquarters, January, 2015. I finally figure out how to convert online leads and how I can package and present and, and, and bring this to the market to help people convert more internet leads. And so at that point in time, I start growing the business. I start hiring employees. I start bringing them on. And so the excitement begins. So I'll never forget one of the first hiring challenges that we faced. We had, um, you know, some new employees coming in and uh, we had a really good hiring process. You know, we had a great relationship with the university. So we actually, um, you know, we had the job posting on the, on the website. We had students, you know, filling out a, uh, uh, a disc profile, if everybody's familiar with the disc profile. Um, and uh, of course, we were looking for high eyes, you know, people that are life of the party, very influential. And, um, you know, we'd call them up on the phone, do an over the phone interview, you know, check their phone voice, see if they sound good. And then we'd actually bring them in, do an in-person interview. And uh, at that point in time, I mean, again, we've got a great talent pool. It doesn't, doesn't really take that much to, to do these calls. Like as long as you've got the personality style and you've got a good voice and things like that, we, you know, we think you would be good at this type of work. Um, but the problem was we would hire them based upon our insight as to whether or not they, we thought they would do good at the job. We'd hire them, we'd bring them in the office. And so this one gentleman comes in on his first day and he's paired up with his trainer and he comes in the office. He's in the office for maybe 10, 15 minutes, just totally overwhelmed by all the stuff we have going on. I mean, we got dialers going, we're working all sorts of different technology, scripts, dialogues, objection handlers. People are being, you know, kick, getting their teeth kicked in on the phones, getting rejected. Uh, this isn't fun stuff that most people are attracted to. And so about 10, 15 minutes in the shift, the guy's like, oh, excuse me, where's the restroom? Yeah, it's right down the hallway. So he takes off down the hallway and we never see that guy ever again. He just completely disappeared, vanished on us. He didn't, he didn't have the heart to tell us that he wasn't into what we were into. And so he just went to the bathroom and we never saw him ever again. So at that point in time, we realized that one of our challenges was that we were basically tricking people into doing the work that we wanted to do. We, candidates were not very clear on what the expectations were. What were they going to be doing? What was the level of productivity? You know, what, what, what level of teamwork or individual work, or is this a creative outlet? Is this some, some type of place where you can get feedback? All these different types of things, uh, they didn't have clear expectations. And so this is what we did. We decided after the interview, once we, once we get a good feel for, you know, whether we think they're a good fit for our organization, we're actually going to take a step and invite them for an observation. And so we say, hey, really impressed with your qualifications, with your you know, resume, with your interview today. The next step in our interview, though, is to invite you back for an observation. And so here's actually a um, video, just a video walkthrough of our office. But this essentially kind of simulates an observation experience. What we're going to say is we're going to invite you back to our office and we're going to pair you up with one of our most senior representatives and they're going to give you a full tour of our office and a full tour of our operations. You're going to see exactly what's expected of you on a daily basis. You're going to see exactly the calls that you're going to make. You're going to see exactly the technology you're going to use. You're going to see how our shifts begin, how they end. You're going to see who leads the floor and what type of communication, what type of chain of order there is. You're going to know exactly what's expected of you, right? At the highest of levels. 
And then at that point, we want you to go home and basically send us an email and let us know whether or not you think you're going to be a great fit for our company. And uh, this has been a really great tool. Again, this is one of those culture tools that no matter where you're at in your business, whether it's just you or whether you get a small team, if, there's, if you're trying to scale something that you're currently doing, invite that candidate in for an observation and give them a taste of what it is that you expect of them. I hear too many complaints too many times of entrepreneurs that bring someone in that they feel like you know, they would be a good fit at their role. And then they come in and it's, it's totally the wrong hire and they got to scrap everything and start back over. Well, implement this one little step. It only takes an hour for us. Um, and you can also look at it as almost an hour free training, you know, cause you're kind of giving them, them the ropes. This is kind of like day one stuff, you know, but we show them, you know, our huddle board here, how we, uh, how we start all the shifts, all that type of stuff. So they have a very, very, very clear, uh, uh, idea of exactly what's going to be expected of them. Hey, will you turn on the light? Thanks. So that's, this is kind of what an observation looks like. Um, now we're going to keep moving along here in the story. So that's, that's one failure right? We, we were hiring, hiring just random people that didn't know what was going on. So now we've got the observation in place and we're hiring good people. In May 2015, you can see we're busting at the seams here and there's yours truly building more desks proudly. Uh, man, isn't it great, Matt, when you find the, the good old glory day pictures like this that uh, remind you of the grinding days? Definitely uh, makes you appreciate the journey and sometimes you forget how much ground you cover, right? You don't give yourself enough credit yeah. 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 I had to dig deep for this one, but, uh, but there it is. There's proof, man. Those, those desks and all their glory were uh, hand handcrafted by yours truly. So we were busting at the seams, leading with revenue, um, you know, bringing on new clients, but, uh, but making sure that we weren't growing too quickly and um, hiring more employees. Now we have actually got the observation in place. So we're bringing in good people. Um, but at this point uh, it was interesting because once you start having more than one person, do the same thing, you start immediately introducing variables, right? Variables into the equation because each and every one of us, we all come from different backgrounds, from different experiences, we have different perspectives. And so when you say, here's this greater goal that we all need to accomplish in the world of rocker box, it's call this lead and see if they wanna buy a home, right? Well, it starts to get a little bit more elaborate with that. Each, each um, cl client that you actually call, each conversation that you actually have, you start to notice a little bit more intricacies within the business. And so at this point in our business, we have a bunch of different people kind of similarly achieving the same primary goal, but not in the same way. And so these were some of the training challenges that we faced early on. And, and one of the biggest failures that we had was we didn't have a process in place to formally document all of our best practices and what our systems look like and, and, and what, the, what the minimum standards were. And uh, at this point in time, when you've got all these different people doing all these different things, what we did is we actually looked at that as a resource. And what we did is we implemented a mastermind into our business. And so we had all these different people, again, with different perspectives, different backgrounds, different ideas, and, uh, and, and different masteries. And we said, of course, this is, not what, it, this is what it looks like today. Our, our business has grown quite a bit. But our first mastermind was literally me and my first three employees and one large pizza from Domino's. And I said, Hey guys, can you come in Thursday after hours? Cause we never really crossed paths. We were just, you know, keeping the, the, the floor, the shift covered, so to speak. And, uh, we all showed up and we shared a pizza and I said, Hey guys, can you tell me one thing that you think we're doing really well right now? And can you tell me one thing that you think that we can improve on? And it, it literally started about four years ago with just those first handful of people. And it's grown every single month. We do these month after month after month after month. And I'll give you a couple more outlines and some do's and some don'ts on the mastermind. But just as far as our progression goes here at Rockerbox, every single policy, procedure, SOP, script, dialogue, text, template, anything that we have that's a legitimate process or procedure in our business is actually something that came from one of our family members, from one of our employees. So rather than looking at that as a challenge, oh my gosh, we've got five different people doing it five different ways. Well, let's all sit down together and actually discuss it and see like who has the best way, who has, you know, what ideas do people have? We can collaborate together. And, you know, that's, that really is the power of the mastermind. And here's actually how we begin our masterminds is, is by reading out this, this little excerpt to get people in the right mindset about what the concept of a mastermind is. You know, it's, the concept was, form, was introduced by Napoleon Hill, of course. Uh, in, in his time as classic, Think and Grow Rich. 
but he basically explains that this is the coordination and knowledge and effort of two or more people who work towards a definite purpose and the spirit of harmony. No two minds ever come together without thereby creating a third invisible and tangible force, which may be likened to a third mind. So we actually, we, we apply these in our business. We actually have uh, masterminds uh, in our business and discuss, you know, what are we doing well? What do we need to improve on? And then as you can see from this video, this is what one of our masterminds looks like today. We have one person on the right writing all the good ideas, or I'm sorry, all the positives. And then the other person over here is writing all the negatives. And then we go around at the end and we basically recognize each other for all the positives because that's coming from somewhere. And sometimes it's really cool because some of them used to come from the negative side. Uh, and then we actually go through all the negatives and we basically start masterminding and brainstorming and coming up with ideas on how we can maybe create some systems or some policy structures around some of these things that are popping up on the negatives. And then we actually create some action items and we roll them out and uh, we do these every single month in our business. And so it's, it's really amazing because when you create an organization where you show your people that their ideas are not only, not only are they appreciated, but they're absolutely necessary. Like they're essential to the growth of the organization and people can see their ideas and being put into action items and being put into place and actually then later on showing up on the positive board in a mastermind. That's really revolutionary stuff for building an organization. And again, this is just stuff that I started doing from the start and you know, we just consistently did it over time. And like you said, you do this, you know, time and time and time again, you grind it out for six years straight. Next thing you know, you're an overnight success, right? So I'm going to continue along with the story time here. Some good old photos. This is September, 2015. Um, the business again is continuing to grow. We're actually busting at the seams here. So this, this first room on the right, that's the first room we were in, if you remember. And then now we've actually opened up the door to another office suite next to us. And we start taking over that suite, which is not the ideal setup for uh, obviously a call center configuration, but, uh, but we were doing it, man. We were uh, servicing the demand. We were busting at the seams. We were hiring. We were training. We were developing best practices. We were, you know, had masterminds blowing and going and starting to document all those policies and procedures. But something happened in September 2015. It happens every single year in College Station in September. And it's the, the fall semester begins. Uh, again, our talent pool are all college students at Texas A&M. And so when this, the fall semester began that year in 2015, we got hit pretty hard. Um, and here's the reason why, uh, we had a lot of people that were you know, self-selecting themselves after the observation coming into the business, you know, they were really enjoying the, the growth through the masterminds. But, uh, but what happened is when the fall rolled around and all of a sudden their classes picked up or football season picked back up or some other things that happened that fell on their plate, they immediately just took Rockerbox and were like, Oh, that's just a part-time job. I'll just, I'll just, uh, Hey, I love Rockerbox. I love working here this summer. Love the camaraderie, love the competition. I loved everything I learned, but I'm busy right now, man. I'll, I might come back next summer, you know, uh, or, or maybe if not, then I'll just get another part-time job. Maybe I'll go work at Subway or go, or go sling some bars at the local tavern or um, sl sling some beers at the local tavern. So for me, I realized that was our failure as an organization. It was our failure to, to our team and to our employees to, to show them that the work was fun, meaningful, and most importantly, fruitful to their future success. Because, you know, given the experiences that they were going to gain from having made all these calls, followed up all these leads, learned technology, uh, CRM management, um, you know, all these different skills, these tangible skills, it was going to lead them to wherever they wanted to go after they graduated or whatever type of internship that they wanted to get into. And it was a failure on our behalf to communicate that to them. At the time, we really just kind of had like not really have a flow of business. We just, everybody just kind of showed up and, and went to work immediately. And so at that point we said, we need to implement daily huddle. And for us, this actually happens several times a day uh, because we're, we're, we have part-time staff. So they actually come in for four hour shifts. So they come in at nine o'clock, they come in at one o'clock and they come in at five o'clock. And we have a huddle like this three times a day. And, um, this was our way to basically say like, look, we're all different people. Again, we come from different walks of life and we have different stuff going on outside of life or outside of work. We have our school, we have our social work, um, we have families. So we need to make sure that when we all show up as a team that before we set out on a mission together, that we get connected and we get huddled up so that we can start off on the right foot together. And so I'm going to give you the, a really easy formula for how to, um, create your huddle. Um, and this is just the formula that we follow, 
But the first step is recognition. Um, and so every person, every business has some sort of metrics or scorecards or numbers that you can track um, that, that can relate to your productivity. Um, there's also value-based recognition, right? We talk about core values within an organization. There's ways that you can recognize someone for just living by a core value. So that's how we open up our huddle is we recognize everybody for core, living by the core values. And then we also recognize each other, our top performers, based upon the stats that we keep within our business. So you can actually see in this video here, like we have scorecards, we track all the metrics within our business. So that allows us to, as I would say, anything that you measure, you can improve. And so uh, whatever it, there is in your business right now, associate a number to it. And I guarantee if you have a huddle every day and you talk about that number, that number is going to grow. It's going to improve. Everybody's, most people are competitive by nature. So that's the first thing, recognition. The second thing is education. So we believe that when you show up to work, you're showing up to invest in yourself and become a better version of that self by the time you leave. And so we want to make sure that we're always fine-tuning some sort of craft or skill. Um, and so for us, it's you know a lot of stuff, the work that we do is over the phone. So we're, we're doing objection handlers. We're doing uh, different scripts. You know, different pieces of conversations that we might want to pull out and actually do a deeper dive on and practice. And so um, that's the education portion. Something that you're going to do today, just focus on it, practice it, and, 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 and focus on getting it better. This is also a portion of the huddle where if you have new items to educate your team on, for, like for example for us, uh, whenever we have a mastermind, we'll have some action items that we roll out after the mastermind. So we roll it out in the education portion of the huddle. So there's a, there's a place for that. So everybody knows, hey, I went to the Mastermind Monday night. We talked about a bunch of ideas, but nothing's going to stick unless it comes out in the education portion of the huddle. And then we know it's actually changed and it's going to become policy. So that's education, number two. Number three is connection. So we're all coming together, about to set off on our journey, you know, to, uh, to go on, um, you know, a, a consistent battle together, as I always say, but, uh, but, it, but again, everybody's different. We all have unique different things to offer. And so it's a fun portion of the huddle to kind of break the, the tension and have an opportunity for everybody to connect with each other a little bit differently. And so what I recommend for this is I actually, um, purchased a deck of dinner party conversation starters, uh, kit or something along those lines, like conversation starters is essentially what is what you're looking for. Um, and there's a deck of them. You can buy books of them. You can buy all sorts of things, but it's, it's simply, it's just one question that we have that every single person in the huddle gets to answer. So, you know, like who was your favorite superhero as a child? Or, you know, if you could go on, if you go on any vacation you wanted to, where would it be, you know, and why just these simple thought provoking questions that allow your team an opportunity to engage a little bit more with each other on a more personal level. So that's the connection portion, number three. And then the last portion, number four is motivation. So again, you're all about to go out on your journey together. Let's get motivated. You know, rah, rah, rah. If there's a, a chant, that's great. For us, we actually have everybody specifically set their goal for that shift. So that way we as a team can hold each other accountable and we can also as a team celebrate our victories. Um, and so for us, again, it's just going around and stating a goal. We'll also have like a one, two, three break thing that literally like, you know, heightens the energy and it gets everybody in that right state of mind. Um, so that's what we do. It works for us, you know, but I would just recommend see what you can do around those four things, recognition, education, connection, and motivation. That's pretty simple. You could create that for any type of business. So that's the master or that's the huddle. I'm sorry that we implemented, uh, that really helped, um, our employees start to understand like, Hey, we're on a mission together. We're going to accomplish things together. We're going to become better versions of ourselves, and we're all going to go out and, and, uh, and crush it today. So that was a really big culture tool for us to help people start to understand and establish that their work was meaningful and that they were part of a team that was you know, serving a higher purpose. So uh, the next thing I want to talk about here is the uh, talent engine is what I like to always talk about. A lot of people always talk about your sales funnels, your marketing funnels. Well, the same thing works with your talent funnel, your talent engine, so to speak. You know, the first step is obviously attracting the right talent. The next step is hiring the right talent. Then you have to train that talent up. And then obviously you want to retain and have stick around the best of that talent. So I've already talked about some of the lessons learned from hiring, some of the lessons learned from training, and some of the le lessons learned from retaining. Uh, and so now I want to just kind of highlight the attraction portion because the attraction is, is first. Um, so for most people, again, when you have an idea, you know, you, you're, you're starting to build a team, you're starting to build a, a crew around you, 
this is where it all starts. This is where it all begins. So this was, was never overlooked in the beginning, but for a lot of people, they feel that people will come and join their tribe or come join their organization or come join their mission or their purpose just because they're solving a problem. Right. Like I said, way back, you know, three, six years ago, I was like, Hey, there's a problem. I'm going to go solve it. That's not a deep enough meaning or purpose to start attracting people to your tribe, so to speak. So for that, that's what you call discovering your why. And I'm sure many of you have probably heard this. It's a very common topic and phrase in the world of entrepreneurship and the world of solopreneurship, infopreneurship is you have to know what mission or purpose you're serving. Like what is your true inner why? Like why did you even take the first step in this direction to go off on this journey alone? Because you have to be able to define that internally for yourself before you can actually start having other people be attracted to that. So that's why your culture will truly be defined on day one, even when it is just a me, myself, and I operation. And so for me, I always knew from the very beginning that my purpose was to move people forward. The very obvious people I was going to help move forward was the people in the sales pipeline, right? These people registering on, online for homes, and I helped them get through the sales pipeline and buy a home. You know, for the real estate teams that hired us, it was great because agents on their team would join their team as like a rookie and just jump in and start working these warm leads and they'd crush it and win awards and start building a career in real estate. And then for the teams that we work with, like Spring, one of my best friends, she's actually tripled her business over the last six years. She now has like 15 agents and she just spends her time, you know, recruiting agents to her team. Her life has changed now. It's completely different than when it was six years ago. And so for that, it's exciting because we've helped her move her, we've helped her move her business forward, move her life forward and help achieve, you know, freedom and, and, and uh, opportunity to spend with her family and invest in the things that she wants to be around. Uh, but for me internally, obviously knowing, Hey, I got to have a talent pool to do this work. I'm going to go to college station. I'm going to hire this, this uh, crew of people that's going to become my family, right? Those people I wanted to move forward. And as you can see through some of these culture tools, We've created and established some really good predictable systems for doing exactly that, for moving these people forward. So this is, a, this is a picture of our wall of champions is what we call it. And we call it the wall of champions because one of our core values is that we possess the mindset of a champion. And here's our core values posted up on the wall. So these are things that are very, very visible and very obvious within our business that, again, our, our purpose is to move people forward. We can see the people that we're actually working with in our office and helping move forward. And then also we've been built on core values from day one and really where I derive these from. And if you don't have a set of core values yet, you can do simply this. This is what I did. I was on a flight to go visit a beta client and I, as a business student from Texas a I thought, oh my gosh, I can't believe I don't have core values. I read this in a textbook somewhere. <laughs> and so I sat there and I thought, well, based upon all of my previous professional experiences, the best jobs that I've had and the worst jobs that I've had. What are the core lessons that we can derive from those experiences? And so these are the five values that I wrote down. Um, I've worked at some tremendous um, companies. I've worked at some piss poor companies. I've worked for big box retail. I've worked for really small uh, privately owned companies. And this was basically me saying, if I'm going to build an organization and I want to surround myself with people, I want them to be people that I want to be around. <laughs> and if I want them to be people that I want them to be around, or that I want to be around, I want them to live by these values. And so by defining those values on day one and being very purposeful about the types of people that we trained and brought into our organization and hired, um, it's, been, it's helped us to establish this culture that is really, really contagious. And so the last thing I'm going to show you here is to go back and bring this all full circle. The first culture tool we talked about was an observation. We said, hey, come on in, take a peek at our office, let us know what you think. These are some of the reviews that we get from some of the observations from having a part-time college student walk into our office and watch an environment where there's a bunch of people making phone calls to people searching for homes on the internet. So I just want to, again, frame that. Like this is not a sexy business. This is people searching for homes on the internet and we call them and say, and, and basically facilitate the whole process and we're like an online concierge system for them. But that's not very sexy, okay? But this is the feedback that we get from people who actually come into our organization and get to witness it firsthand. We get comments like, Positive reinforcement. This company is different. A great experience that can better me for my future. Makes me excited to be able to learn. Supportive and uplifting. Family rather than just coworkers. High energy and competitive attitude. Successes are rewarded. Has fun with each other while also focusing on the task at hand. And I feel that I would start to become addicted to meeting my goals at work. 
And I absolutely love this because these are all connected to every single one is connected to one of our core values that we have. And it's not like we told them to memorize these and recite them back to us and then they get the job. This is literally just giving someone a total unbiased perspective of our business and say, Hey, just write us an email and let us, let us know what you think. And there's two types of emails we get. We get emails like this that are people basically writing us a persuasive essay on why they want to be a part of this culture and be around these people so that they can be challenged and that they can be excited to learn and that they can be in a supportive and uplifting environment and so that they can feel that they can become addicted to meeting their goals. We get that type of email. And the other type of email we get is just no email at all. <laughs> and that's when you know you have true culture is when, when you can strongly attract or you can strongly repel the right type and the wrong types of people to your organization. So that's what I've got um, for my brief culture talk here. I wanted to save some time, obviously. Dude, that's amazing. With the audience here. So what do you got, Matt? Bro, I got a bunch of notes is what I got. I got some amazing things and, you know, some of the stuff that I know but needed reminders on and other stuff that I didn't really even think about. But I want to make sure that we, uh, I got some questions for you and I know we got some questions that started to roll out here in the end. So I would encourage anybody that has questions to think about this, right? And don't think about just where you're currently at right now. Think about your own vision and where you're looking to grow into and what things you could potentially learn or extract from Josh right now based on the trajectory or the path or the vision um, that you are moving towards. So keep that in mind as you, uh, you curate and craft your own questions. But with that being said, uh, Aaron, or I'm sorry, Ernesto had said, uh, for millennials who seek meaningful work, how do you make the daily tasks such as email and call follow-ups and some of those monotonous things that many people, like you said, don't see as a very sexy, fun, exciting business, purposeful, knowing that that's so meaningful to them? Yep. So it's, it's, uh, it's interesting because, you know, I always say that you, everybody has some sort of a measurement. Uh, there was a business book I was reading not too long ago, and it was about um, some sort of warehouse, some you know, warehouse dingy warehouse where they produce stuff doesn't sound like anything exciting or fancy or motivating but whatever it was the um the crew completed like five whatever it was it was five and so this consultant comes into the business and he's he's there to inspire people and start increasing productivity and so he basically says like well what is the metric that you do and they're like well we normally do five whatever it is we do five of them it's like okay so he pulls out a piece of chalk and he writes on the floor of the, of the warehouse a giant number five. And so when the next shift comes in, they're like, what's this? I'm like, oh, that's no big deal. It's just from the shift before you. That's just how many that they did. And so naturally, what do we do as humans? Like, oh, they think they could do five. Well, guess how many we're going to do? We're going to do six. So I don't even know what it is that you're doing. If it's an email, if it's a phone call, if it's an appointment or whatever. If you're not measuring it currently, then I guarantee the results are, are pretty terrible. Once you start measuring it, performance automatically increases. So it, even if it is a, a, a menial task, like an email or a call or whatever, you know, count it. You know, maybe it's maybe maybe your goal is to get ten, and then you get some points, and then you associate that with some some sort of prize or whatever. Gamifying your business. Um, I know there's a really amazing app in the real estate space called Sisu, S I S U, and they do a phenomenal job of gamifying all of the activities in the real estate space. The calls, your emails, literally has a way to, uh, you know, did you meditate today? Did you do, how many high fives did you give out? So it's just tracking the numbers. So just start tracking what you're doing and there'll be a way to uh, inspire people to get more of. Um, one other thing, like recently in our business, we've implemented a warm transfer feature. And um, obviously it's, very exciting. We're kind of a shortcut business. And so this is even a better shortcut because we can live transfer hot lead to someone. And so I wanted to heighten the awareness of this. And so obviously you, you train staff, that, Hey, there's this going on, but if you really don't drive and incentivize them, you start thinking of what type of character, what type of stick method do you want to use? So for college students, it's very easy to motivate them with food. So what I did was went to, you know, one of the local taco shops here that everybody loves and bought a bunch of gift cards uh, but rather than just give them out for doing the desired behavior, um, I added a little bit of luck into it. So we bought a little putting green. And so again, we're, we're having people, you know, start measuring the activities that produce their desired result. And then when they get that, we throw a little chance into it and they get to putt and they might win some tacos or something. So it literally, it can be the simplest thing in your business. Once you start measuring it, you gamify it, add some incentive to it and it becomes fun and it becomes meaningful. I love the gamification aspect of it. I think, you know, orange theory is a perfect 
model, right? And to look at what they've done and how they've gamified it. And then you see so many different people now gamifying certain aspects of their business. It's just the way we're wired, right? We all want to compete. We all want to win. So yeah. I love that because you said, right, menial tasks, that adds purpose to it when you are like, I got to win. I got to yeah. win. It doesn't matter how many emails or whatever it is. So that's awesome. Aaron asked, do you call investor leads like distressed seller leads or do you guys only do traditional sellers and buyers in real estate? Yeah, we don't currently, but, uh, you know, we, we, our bread and butter is basically inbound, um, uh, you know, a residential home buyer lead. Um, but you know, I'm a, an entrepreneur like Matt, you always got to be opportunistic. So I'm always open to conversations with any about anybody about any type of opportunity that, uh, that might be advantageous to both of us. So tell me a little bit more about your, you know, how much do you involve your employees in creating the vision and culture versus creating it for them? And I know you kind of answer this question in regards to the masterminds and to the huddles. Are there other things that you give them more DNA and ownership over, or do you kind of just create the spaces for them to have input? Um, but it's still kind of a top down type of, so we, yeah, that's a good question. We've um, obviously by bringing in the right people and, you know, I think for some people core values is like, you got to ask yourself, um, you know, it's just like, it's like diet and exercise. You can't go to the gym on the 1st of January and put in a good 14 hour workout and be set for the year, right? Yeah. It's about good, consistent you know, work over time. And so for us, when we say we have core values, it's not just like, well, we got a really cool piece of artwork and put it up on the wall. When it, when it goes to the core values, when you go through the hiring process, um, it's obviously something that they're quizzed and they have to recite and they have to pass tests in order to get to that point. But then every single day in the huddle, we're recognizing people for living by core values. And then every single month in our mastermind, we're recognizing people for living by the core values. And then every single year at our big Christmas awards gala, we literally have a core value award. It's like a big giant crystal that, we, that people can nominate who, you know, who, who do you think deserves this core value award, this core value, this core value. And so it's nominated by our team to who wins those awards. So it's, it's, it's driven into our people over and over and over again that this is the type of people that we want to be and that mm -hmm. way that we want to act and that we want to behave. And so if you get people to lock in on that, I give them all the freedom in the world. I haven't touched a training document or a script or a policy or procedure in probably three years in my business. Um, I empower our leaders um, to create all that stuff because I know that as long as they're, they're living and abiding by the core values, the nitty gritty is, I mean, you got to be okay with other people taking on tasks within your business and empowering other people to, to take on tasks within your business. And as long as you can, you know, accept that, you're never going to get maybe but an 80% of what you were capable of. Um, if you can live with that and go to bed at night, and it doesn't drive you crazy. Um, then you should be empowering people in your business. As long as they're living by the core values, give them as much freedom as possible. Mm, I love that. And that kind of ties in actually with Aaron's question. How are you able to let go and delegate allowing others to do tasks that you know, maybe you could do better. Right. And you kind of, I think, asked to that would you add anything to that or do you answer that would you add uh, this was that? actually yeah this was something i saw on like a gary v ask gary v from like three years ago some some guy was like hey i, I you know I'm, I'm having struggling with my business and, and gary asked the guy you know what what level of performance that they that he thought that they were at and he told the guy that as a business owner like you're you're insane if you think someone's gonna work as well as you do at your business it's your business you're the one who owns it why would someone work as hard at your business as you do? So you just have to learn and understand that as you're building a business, yes, you're going to get people that, are, that will buy in, that will contribute, that will live, with the, live by the mission and, and, and fly your banner and fly your, your flag and fly it proudly. But as an entrepreneur, you, under, you have to understand we are wired differently. We are kind of crazy. We are kind of strange. So uh, as you build your entrepreneurial organization, understand that um, – it's going to be difficult to surround yourself with other entrepreneurs because if you, if you surround yourself with other true entrepreneurs, they're going to go off and do their own thing. Um, so you're going to have to surround yourself with entrepreneurial employees is what I would like to say. Mm. What's your, uh, what's your take on the, you know, slow to hire, quick to fire and, and how, what's your philosophy on that with being that you have so many bodies in your organization? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I like the, I like the phrase, um, Fortunately, though, I was raised in a big box retail environment. I got uh, I got to earn my uh, my um, you know keeps at Best Buy back in the day, 
And uh, as a manager at Best Buy, you were always taught you never fire anybody, right? Because when you work for a big box retailer, you don't want to actually fire someone because then they're going to go and you got to pay them uh, workers comp and all sorts of stuff. And then as a big box retailer, you don't want all your you know lower level, just random store managers firing a bunch of people and getting you in a bunch of lawsuits. So it was like we could never actually fire anybody at Best Buy. We just had to help people come to the realization that they were no longer fit for the team. So I learned that very young. I was probably 17, 18 years old, manager at Best Buy, and, and, and learned that lesson then. And so I still apply that now. So technically at Rockerbox, we've never fired anybody. Um, you know, It's your job as a leader and as a manager to train people up to where they need to be to perform at the level that they need to perform at. So I always ask my leadership team two questions. Did they know it was expected of them? And did you provide them the tools and the training to execute what was expected of them? Mm. And if you answer yes to both of those, and at that point, they're just being insubordinate. Then at that point, we have had a handful of heart to heart conversations with people in our organization and just say, Hey Matt, you know what, man, it just seems like our standards are just too high and you've got this going on. You've got that going on. I mean, I just feel like we're just, we're, we're asking too much of you and, uh, and that's not fair, man. And there's no reason for us to, you know, be bitter at one another. We can just shake hands and part ways and, and move along. And so we've had to do that a handful of times, but, but again, yes, higher slow. Uh, but yeah, don't just, don't just go around and start, you know, flying in and, uh, and axing people. people and axing people to try to convey your authority. So, well, one of my mentors told me this and I thought it was just a great piece of advice is as the leader, if you have to fire somebody, it's your own damn fault. Like yep. you obviously did something wrong in that process where you didn't clearly communicate something. You didn't put, you didn't hire the right person, right? You didn't put them in the right position to elevate them, whatever it may be. Right. And kind of mm -hmm. coaching, taking ownership of that and coaching them out of the position and, or being very clear in that process of, what the expectations are and deciding if that's going to be a fit and trying that one more time and whatever it may be. But I love what you said there. Uh, any final questions? If you guys have those, go ahead and throw that, that in the, in the chat. I want to make sure we wrap up on time. Uh, final question that I personally have for you is what do you think is the most important skill for hiring and being a great leader of people, being that you've had so many, you know, some people run these tight knit teams and organizations, right? But as you continue to scale and grow, uh, what, what do you think has been the best skill or characteristic uh, in your own journey that has served you really well with growing such an amazing culture and team? Yep, that's a great question. I think that people naturally tend to follow uh, leaders that have either A, overcome an incredible amount of adversity, uh, or they B, ha have an incredible amount of credibility and having done what it is that they did. So for me, I did not really have much adversity to overcome. So I just went the credibility route and I said, I'm going to roll up my sleeves. And I'm going to figure out how these internet leads can be followed up with. So it was literally, um, you know, being able to swallow your pride. I was, uh, I was 29, 30 years old. And when I started Rockerbox, I'm, I'm here in a college town. When I started Rockerbox, I actually went and bartended at the local college bars at night. So that I could keep my dream alive, so that I could keep my rent paid, so that I could keep my bills paid. Um, because I knew, again, as I was doing these beta tests for all these clients, I was investing in myself. I was going to gain the knowledge and I was going to own all the equity of that knowledge because I made the investment myself and, uh, and I did whatever it took. And so, again, it was about a year and a half or two years of me doing the work. And then I had the, 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 the ability to confidently lead a team to do that work. So I, you know, again, I learned at a very young age as leaders should never ask what you're not willing to do yourself. And so, um, after literally grinding it out for a year and a half, two years on the phone, I had no problem hiring anybody and having a really high standard for what the levels of performance were. We stand up when we call our employees lock up their cell phone before they clock in on their shift. Uh, I mean, I'm teaching them the values of, of the exchange of money, you know, where you're exchanging your time for money. So I expect all of your time and I'll give you all of the money. Um, so these are the type of, you know, no BS type of standards that I can hold my people to because I, I held myself to those same standards. Um, and so a lot of times I'm always questioned by people in business who ask, you know, they're wanting to build this new part of their business or maybe a new lead strategy or something like that. And so I always ask them, is there somebody in your business that's already doing this at a high level? And if the answer is no, then that's not, not a good sign, not a good starting place. So again, for me, I would say I vote the credibility route. Uh, roll up your sleeves, do the work, do the grind, do the, gu do the hustle and never ask someone what you aren't willing to do yourself. I love it, dude. 
Well, with that being said, uh, if you guys have any final questions, uh, be sure to post them inside the Facebook community and um, we'll make sure that we, uh, we throw Josh in there. And also, Josh, if they want to check out more of what you're up to and you know, your brand, your business, engage with you outside of our platform, where's the best place for them to, to find that information? Yeah, definitely. If you want to keep up with all our content on Rockerbox, we've got a great Facebook page. Uh, my, my beautiful wife keeps it up to date. She's got lots of employee testimonials, client testimonials, success stories, great stuff on there. So give us a like on Facebook. It's facebook.com slash rocker box and we spell it kind of strange it's r-o-k-r-b-o-x rock r box and then if you want to shoot me an email i'm very easy to get a hold of it's josh at rocker box that's r-o-k-r-b-o-x dot com and yeah i'd be happy to chat with you and uh very excited again to, to get some exposure here to your uh your mastermind group matt and uh it's been an honor and a pleasure we appreciate you brother and uh, i know we only got to really scratch the surface here tonight um so we might have to do this again but you know i think overall uh, what you have done is is it's just impressive, man. It's inspiring, and just your uh, your commitment to your people, your commitment to your vision, your company, your customers. Uh, it's honestly, it's unlike many businesses I've I've ever been around or seen. So I'm excited to see what you guys do with the momentum you have and the platform you've built. Uh, you've just poured such a strong foundation. It's going to be exciting to see what the next ten years look like for you guys. And um, again, share this on social media, guys, and. Uh, feel free to invite anybody into the community that you think would get value of connecting with people like Josh and our other millionaire mentors and tactical trainers. And uh, with that being said, we'll see you guys on the next call.